Hello, and welcome to Ancient Words Speak Today. I'm Pastor Nathan Krauss, and I invite you to join me as together we look into the pages of Scripture to discover how the Bible is still relevant to our lives and how these ancient words really do speak today. Bible study, Bible presentation, you know, with Pastor Nathan has been such a wonderful blessing, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, he has been traveling and studying around the whole world, teaching. Uh, he even got to live almost a year in the heart of the city of Jerusalem. And I was blessed, one among 200 pastors two years ago, right, Pastor Nathan? He organized an amazing trip to the holy lands of Israel and Jordan. It was just an amazing blessing, right? And he, I mean, he just knew everything. I mean, he had lived there, you know, so, yeah, it was just a wonderful blessing. And maybe he will, he will share some more, some, some, more, some experiences there, as we still have uh, quite a few to go. And let me welcome our precious online audience. So welcome, joining us from wherever you are. And thank you for putting those comments about Pastor Nathan's presentations. And I heard people saying, oh, he has such a gift of... Uh, conversationally uh, sharing the Word of God, you know? And uh, other, uh, someone now said, oh, I just love those experiences he shares, you know? <laughs> and his testimony, you know? They're, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and all of us here in person are concurring, right? We're saying, yes, right on. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I'm glad to be with you again. And I wanna thank the introduction to what's coming. I'm, I'm really excited. I tell you, one of my favorite things to study is scientific evidence for vindication of scriptures. I just love it. And um, you mentioned the Hittites. People used to think they were non-existent. You know, the Bible made up this group of people who were enemies of God. And when I was in Turkey, I was actually um, wanting, on, on my own, backpacking around the Middle East, visiting sites, and I wanted to go and see as much of Turkey as I could, and you could only go so far east before you got into dangerous, you know, the Kurds were controlling some of that area. And I got to a place where I was on, a, I forget the Turkish name for the, it's kind of a, a large van, a small bus, something in between there. And um, I was on with people who didn't speak English, and they had their goats and their chickens, and we were just riding to the middle part of the country, because I wanted to see a place called Hattushis. It was recently excavating there at Hattushis, and that was the ancient Hittite Empire capital. And so um, I got there, it was kind of a drizzly day, there was no excavation going on. Germans were controlling the excavation site there. And pretty working, but I happened to run into a local guy there, and didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak more than just a few words of Turkish, so I could greet him, and then the conversation kind of ended shortly afterward. And then we covered, we realized, well, my apologies for the audio problems with this recording. What we realized is that we both spoke a little bit of German, and we were able to communicate that way. Um, had a very interesting time, but that's a story for another day. I'd like to welcome you back to the series Amazing Prophecies, and um, this lesson is on the second coming of Jesus. What will it be like? Will there be a secret rapture of God's people before that? And how many people will see Jesus when he comes? In World War II, Japan had invaded the American-occupied Philippines, and then on February 22nd of 1942, FDR ordered that the troops needed to leave. MacArthur left, and when he was in Australia, he promised that he would return. And finally, on October 20th, 1944, about two and a half years later, General MacArthur did return with the troops, and he kept his promise. Jesus also made a promise that he would return one day that he would come back to this earth once again and receive his saints, those who he left behind when he went to heaven. Can we believe the promise of Jesus? 
Well, certainly Jesus is much more trustworthy than General MacArthur was, who was only human, and Jesus will make good on his promise. Let's take a look at what scripture says. What promise did Jesus make to the human family before he went to heaven? In John 14, 1 through 3, we read, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's really what Jesus wants. That's the burden of his heart, to have the people he loves, those he died for, you and me, to be with him where he is. And so his promise is he will return again. He's got a place prepared for us in heaven, and he's coming again to receive us. He promised he'll come back, and he'll take us to be with him in heaven. So what are the specifics of that? What will that look like? How does the Bible describe the return of Jesus? Well, in Titus 2, verse 13, we read, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So one of the things the Bible says about the return of Jesus is not only that it's the blessed hope of the believers, but that it will be a glorious appearing when Jesus comes back. He is our great God and our Savior, and his return will be glorious. All the glory of God will be revealed when Jesus comes again. So that's starting to hint toward the idea that maybe this isn't going to be a secret rapture like many have taught, right? For how long have people been looking forward to the return of Jesus? Way back in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, Job 19, 25 and 26 says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. What a beautiful promise. Job believed it, we can believe it, that we will see God in our flesh. Not a, just a spiritual experience, but truly in these bodies. What great hope does the return of Jesus promise the world? Revelation 21.4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What a beautiful promise. All right, let's pick up with the recording at this point. Presses them closer to Jesus. And uh, by God's grace, our experience, my wife and I, and the trials we've gone through, we've just said, Lord, <laughs> we're going to trust you through this. We're going to press closer to you. And somehow he got us through. And many times it was also not possible for us to get through without the, the love and support of his people, the church. I want to encourage you now, if you're not part of God's church family, get connected to a church, to a good, solid, Bible-believing church, because when life hits you hard, it sure is good to have brothers and sisters in Christ to help you through. All right, so, sorry for that long diversion, but as I told you before, I don't charge any extra for these, so you're not paying me by the hour. Aren't you glad? All right, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's a promise I cherish. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Beautiful promise. I love it. When will Jesus come back to this world? Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, Of that day and hour no one knows. We've looked at this passage before. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus says, my father has an appointed time, he knows, but no one else knows. And he, we, can't, we shouldn't predict a date or a time. People have been doing that throughout the ages, and they've always been wrong. Um, and it only makes Christians look foolish when, when that happens. Is it possible to know when Jesus' return is near? If we don't know the day or the hour, can we get an idea when it's near? Well, in Matthew 24, 32 and 33, we read, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, 
know that it is near at the doors. So as it gets closer with these, you'll see more and more of the signs. And we looked at those in the second lesson. Remember our second time together? We looked at the signs of the times and seeing the signs. So we noted that they're getting more and more frequent and more and more intense. And so with, that's an indication that we're getting closer to the day when Jesus will come again. We don't know when that day is, but we know that today we're a day closer than we were yesterday. So we ought to be preparing always. What will Jesus' return be like? This is, this is going to be, for me, this is exciting to talk about. Take a look at what the Bible says the return of Jesus is going to be like. Acts 1, 10 and 11. While they looked, this is the disciples who were with Jesus on the Mount of Olives. Pastor Robson, we stood there on the Mount of Olives. You're looking across the Kidron Valley toward the west. You're looking over to Jerusalem and, and that beautiful city with so much history. Uh, but Jesus in his day looked across to Jerusalem too. And he longed for Jerusalem to be saved, but they wouldn't come to him. He said, I long to gather you, Luke 13, 34, I believe it is, as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. Do you have time for another little diversion? Can I preach a little bit tonight? Do you, do you have, per, do have permission of our online viewers? <laughs> you can comment that you're annoyed at me if you like, but I want to share a little thing. You know, when you think about a hen gathering her chicks, chicks there was... Um, a farmer whose barn burned down. Now, as a kid growing up in Pennsylvania, I know about that. I've seen barns. Actually, there were some vandals that were burning barns. It's terrible. These historic barns, some kids were just thinking it'd be fun to light them and burn them down. Um, my grandfather's barn was one of them, and then my uncle out the road had another historic barn. Thank God they're both still standing. Uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch people paint hex signs on them. Um, you know what a hex sign is? It's a cultural thing to bring good luck or ward off evil spirits. They, they have meaning, okay? But um, it's Pennsylvania Dutch art. And one of the friends of my, actually a guy that uh, my father worked on his farm. He was an old man by the time I was a little boy. When my father was a young man, he worked on this farm. That man's barn burned down. And all of the Mennonite neighbors came together and helped build his barn again. But before they could build it, they had to clean things up. And so we were there. I was part of the crew as a boy cleaning up all the stuff. And you see all the rubble and you found some, you know, dead animals and things in it. But in one story, a farmer, this isn't my story, okay, but this is what happened. A farmer discovered in the rubble of his burned out barn, he said, I've lost everything. And he's going through it the next day. And he seems to hear this peeping sound. He's like, what is this? He hears little peeps coming from a direction. He walked over there and he saw a mound in the ashes. He kicked it over with his foot. It was a dead mother hen. And under her wings were the surviving chicks. She kept them safe in the fire, gave her life so that they might survive the fire. Jesus said to the people of Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you. I longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. It's sad. So Robson, we, you know, that's what I think of when I think, I think I might have even talked about that on our, to our group when we were standing on the Mount of Olives looking across. But there on the Mount of Olives, that's the point, the spot where Jesus ascended to heaven. So his disciples were with him and on that spot, these are the words that were spoken, or this is the, re the record of it from the book of Acts. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by, beside them in white apparel. So we know they weren't men, they were angels. They appeared as men. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So, the promise is, same Jesus coming in the same way. Jesus coming is going to be literal, in other words. Uh, will the return of Jesus be witnessed by people on the earth? Revelation 1.7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. 
So yeah, every eye is going to see him, the Bible tells us. Um, here's another one. The sign of the Son of Man will appear. This is from Matthew 24, 30. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. How many? All. all. So all the people groups on planet earth. Um, remember, earth dwellers are considered those who are lost. So th there's going to be people who are going to mourn because they weren't expecting the coming of Jesus and they, they weren't prepared. Um, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now in the Bible, when we read about the clouds of heaven, it's referring to angels. The angels are like a cloud of angels coming with him. Okay? Will the return of Jesus be heard by people on earth? Okay, we said they'll, every eye will see and all the tribes of the earth are going to experience it. Will it be heard? 1 Thessalonians 4.16 I like to call this the noisiest verse in all the Bible. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And I can't wait to hear that shout of God. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Now, I, I have a shofar. Last time we were there in Israel, I bought it. I have the big, long, the jumbo, you know, the big one, the, the horn. And I like to practice it at home. I blow it up. The dogs hate it, of course. Um, but I blow it, and my kids, they're like, Dad, must you? So they're off to college. Now only my wife has to put up with it. And I try to do it when she's not home. Every day I try to blow that shofar just to stay in tune. Or, and my sent me a meme on Instagram. Um, it showed a guy, a, a, Jewish, a picture of a Jewish pr a priest from you know, Bible days blowing the shofar. And it said, how, uh, what I think I, look, I sound like when I blow the you know, how I see myself when I blow the shofar. That's what it said. And then the next picture below it was a clown blowing a little noisemaker. And it said, how other people see me when I blow the shofar. Uh, but anyway, I like to try to blow that shofar. And it's loud. You can really get a loud. I mean, I have to do it indoors because even inside, the neighbors can hear it. But can you imagine what the trumpet of God is going to sound like? Awesome. I mean, I can't wait to hear that. So this is the noisy verse. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. It's going to wake up the dead. Jesus will call them forth from the grave. What will the return of Jesus look like? Psalm 50 verse 3 says this, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Well, we know that. We just read a verse from the New Testament that reaffirms what the Old Testament says here. He is not going to be silent when he comes. A fire shall devour before him. Catch this. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. You know, God, fire seems to often symbolize God's presence. The burning bush. Um, angels with flaming swords before that to keep Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after they had sinned and were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Then the burning bush we see. We see fire coming down from heaven at the altar on Mount Carmel when there was a showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. We see the pillar of fire before that, of actually, with um, the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, led by a pillar of fire. So fire is often representing God's presence. And um, we saw that Lucifer dwelt in the midst of fiery stones by the by the. Um, the throne of God before he sinned. It seems that God will allow the fiery trials to come. Okay, here I am sermonizing a little bit again, and I'm not charging any extra, remember. He'll allow those fiery trials to come to our life so that the fires of trial can burn out the dross in our lives and perfect our characters. And if that doesn't happen, and we're not prepared for his coming by allowing Jesus to shape our character and make us fit for heaven, what will happen? Well, the fire of his presence will consume us. We're being prepared by fiery trials to be in the midst of the fiery presence of God. That's my thought on this. But anyway, a fire shall devour before him, very tempestuous all around him. 
That's the glory of his return. So here's the characteristics of Jesus' return. We saw that it would be the same Jesus coming in the same way. It's a literal coming. It's not spiritual like, oh, he already came, or some people will know it and others won't know. It's, it's real, it's literal, it's not imaginary, and it's not like he comes for you when you die and he comes for you when you die. And that, no, literal coming, same way, same Jesus coming in the same way. It will be visible. Every eye will see him. All the tribes will see. It will be audible. The shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. And of course, he shall not keep silent. And then glorious, the fire devouring before him, very tempestuous all around him. So, if it's literal, visible, audible, and glorious, is there any question that you can't miss it? Is this going to be quite an event that the world won't miss? All right. Now let me just take a moment to talk about every eye will see him. I've heard people say in the past, you know, with the advent of television, now we can see how, you know, when Jesus comes, there will be news cameras and everybody will be able to watch it on TV. And now with the advent of the internet, oh, look, people will be streaming the coming. Listen, I really don't think God needs human technology in order for every eye to see him. The brightness of the heavens. How many eyes can see the sun on planet Earth? It doesn't say every eye will see him at the same time. I imagine Jesus circling the globe like Santa Claus does. Or, no. <laughs> but, but that Jesus will circle the globe in his coming because he says the angels will, will, will gather his people. I can imagine him circling the globe and the angels harvesting planet Earth of all those souls who are ready to meet him. That tempestuous fire devouring all around him as he does so. He doesn't need TV or the internet for people to see. It's going to be so glorious and so, I don't know how many angels there are in heaven, but they're, all, they're not going to miss this event. They're all coming with him, and it's going to fill the skies, fill the heavens, even big sky country like Texas. I know Montana thinks they're big sky country, but we have big skies here too, right? So <laughs> no one's going to miss this thing. Um, so what great event will take place at the second coming of Jesus? 1 Thessalonians 4.16, which we looked at because it's the noisiest verse in all of the Bible. But it does say there that the dead in Christ will rise first. That's a great event. That is the resurrection of the sleeping saints. And in John 5, 28 and 29, we read, The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. <clears throat> all, not just the saved, but all. Those who have done good are going to come forth to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the res resurrection of condemnation. And we looked at, in our study of the millennium, we looked at the resurrection of life is at the beginning of the millennium, and then after a thousand years, those that are lost are raised in the resurrection of condemnation. condemnation. They're brought forth so that they can face judgment. They can see that Jesus is the judge. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, and then they will face judgment. All right, uh, what incredible transformation takes place in the living saints at Jesus' return? Okay, so those of us who have the privilege to still be alive when Jesus comes back, we never taste death. We don't ever have to, we, we never have to go to the grave. Jesus returns while we're still living. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53 says, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So now the dead are going to come forth with an incorruptible body. And then it says, and we shall be changed. Paul's talking about we who are alive. We shall be changed. Of course, he's sleeping in the grave now, so he's not part of that we anymore. But while he was living, he included himself. We shall be changed because guess what? We can't go to heaven with this corruptible body. The whole uh, passage there in the context, he's talking about the corruptible must put on incorruption. We have to be changed so that we have a heavenly body that we will have for all eternity, one that will not cor uh, be corruptible. Uh, there it is. He says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Remember, we looked at uh, Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy that God alone has immortality. And he wrote to the Romans that they were seeking immortality. We should seek after it. So only God is immortal. We are given the gift of immortality from God. 
That's the transformation that has to take place for the living saints. The, those who have died and are brought forth, they're going to already come up with an incorruptible body. They're going to be trans, transformed in the process of the resurrection. We will be transformed like that in the twinkling of an eye, Paul says later in this chapter. Uh, what warning did Jesus give in relation to his second coming? Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in, that, in the days before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. So they were living their lives. They were just going on as if life was normal. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them away, took them all away, so also will the, son, the coming of the Son of Man be. So, Jesus is saying, just as there were people who were unprepared in the days of the flood, when Noah entered the ark, there were people who didn't believe it, didn't, they scoffed at it, they were unprepared. In the same way, there are going to be people who are unprepared when he comes. Okay? That's the warning he gives regarding his second coming. People will be caught unawares, going on as if life is normal. What did Jesus mean when he said that when he returns, one would be taken and another left? We need to understand this because that's where this idea of the, the, uh, the secret rapture comes from, right? I mentioned last time, I said, what, what if my bus driver is a Christian or my my pilot on my flight is a Christian, and, and they're raptured away secretly. The plane's going down, you know. Um, is that the way God's going to do it? Well, this secret rapture idea is uh, one of the texts they use to support it is this one. So we want to make sure we understand it, because it's there. Let's figure it out. What did he mean when he said one would be taken and another would be left? Well, in Matthew 24, verses 40 through 42, it says, Then two men will be in the field. Then meaning when he comes. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore. This is the point. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. The point is, one of those men in the field was ready and the other was not. That's why one was taken and one was left. One of those women at the mill was ready and the other is not. That's why one was taken and the other was left. Jesus is teaching that just as in the days of Noah, there will be people who are lost. Is the return of Jesus going to be a secret? Matthew 24, 26 says, if they say to you, now this is Jesus speaking him, himself, he's saying this. If they say to you, look, he's in the desert. Should we go check it out? Jesus says, do not go out. Don't even go check it out. Don't set yourself up for deception. If they say, Jesus returned, the Messiah has come, he's in the desert, he says, nope. <laughs> you won't have to go look for me in the desert. You'll know when I come. We already looked at all the indications that tell us that. Or if they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Don't listen to anybody who says, you've got to go here to see him or you've got to go there to see that Jesus has already turned return. No, that's not the way it's going to be, Jesus said. What does the Bible say will precede the second coming of Jesus? In Revelation 16, 14, it says this, they are spirits of demons performing signs. We know that before Jesus comes again, there is going to be demons performing signs. They go out to the kings of the earth and, all, and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The battle is a spiritual battle. It's building, it's, it's creating momentum, it's coming, and the demons are create, performing signs to prepare everybody to get them together for this spiritual battle which is being set up. In Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said, false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we know before Jesus comes, there's going to be some real major deceptions going on. But we will not be, see, be deceived. We will be among the elect whom it is impossible to deceive if we are taking the counsel of Jesus. Watch and pray. Be ready. You don't know the day that he's coming. And then you look at all the indications of how he will come and you know what to expect. So you're not going to be deceived. 
In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, more evidence of the signs that the demons will be working. It says, according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Listen, folks, I don't know how it can be any more plain. There's going to be some serious deceptions going on. It's not going to be like, oh, I can tell that's... No, you have got to be spiritually in tune. That's why I believe it's very important for us to live healthfully. Can I go here with you guys? I believe it's very important for us to make healthful lifestyle choices. Do you know why? Because if you're not healthy, your mind can't be healthy. Do you know that when I was into Buddhism and martial arts, I chose to be a vegetarian. Do you know why? Because I understood that when I don't eat animal flesh, I am more in tune. My mind was more prepared to, for meditation and I seem more spiritually in tune. I just noticed that. I'm not picking on anybody. I grew up eating groundhogs and squirrels and rabbits and pheasants and deer and everything we shot. You know, I'm a Pennsylvania Dutchman in my roots. You know, I, that's how I grew up. But I found that not only was everybody else in my family either prematurely dead or diseased at very young ages, but um, I found that me personally, when I made the decision, even as a teenager, to start changing my lifestyle a little bit, that I was more my mind was clearer. If you know that Satan is going to do everything possible with all power, signs, and lying wonders to try to deceive, if possible, even the elect, don't you think it would behooves you to say, I'm going to do everything I can so that my mind is sharp and I'm not deceived. So that I can discern God's word and his will. I can understand. Make choices that are going to help you in this spiritual battle. Um, personally, my choice is um, I've chosen to live mostly as a, as well, they call it vegan, but you know, I eat honey and all that. It's not, I'm not vegan for those. Sometimes people ask me why I'm on a plant-based diet. They say, are you a vegan because of spiritual reasons or, you know, religious reasons or health reasons or for animal rights or for the good of the planet? And my answer is yes, <laughs> I am. All of those are good reasons to choose a plant-based diet. Um, more people would be fed on this planet if we were, there were more vegetarians. It takes a whole lot of land resources and water to grow animal food compared to plant food. Do you want another very interesting statistic? Look it up if you want. Search it online with your favorite search engine, whatever that may be. Plant-based diet in relation to COVID. And the studies indicate that between 70, I've, I've heard 73 up to 83% less likely to contract COVID if you're on a plant-based diet. I mean, doesn't it make sense that taking the original diet that God gave us is going to help us be better prepared? All right. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, God doesn't love you or you're going to be lost if you're not a plant-based person like I choose to be, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you that I think it makes good sense as stewards of everything that God gave us, as managers of what he's given us, including this body temple. It just makes good sense to me to say, I'm going to make the most healthful choices. And sometimes people say to me, well, Jesus ate meat. Yes, he did. He ate the Passover lamb. He ate fish. Um, Even in his resurrected body, he ate fish. But my answer is, I wonder what Jesus would do today in our circumstances when it's so easy to have access to a plant-based diet. You can get all the, when I started out on this, man, there, was, there wasn't a lot of options. You know, I was eating rabbit food is what everybody thought. But it's easy today to live this way. And we already talked about all the benefits for other people on the planet and for your own personal health and, and intellectual sharpness. Uh, by the way, fasting is a biblical practice that so few people, everybody thinks, well, you ask, what are the spiritual disciplines? Bible study, prayer, right? Sometimes people say meditation, meditating on the scripture, witnessing to others, sharing. Very few people talk about fasting, but guess what? Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast, do it this way. He says, don't make a big show of it, but fast for the right reasons. 
I find that when I fast, again, my mind is sharp and clear. Not everybody can fast because of their health, but we can all fast to some degree. You can fast from desserts. You can fast from, uh, you can cut one meal out a day, or you can fast from, if you're not a plant-based person, cut out meat for a week and go on a, a meatless fast. You can fast from the internet. You can fast from TV. You can drop things out of your life with, which help you focus more on God. Okay? So Jesus expects us to fast. Um, he wasn't talking about the internet and TV in his day, of course, but that's not a bad idea. All right, back to our lesson. Satan is going to do his best to deceive everybody, including God's people. We should do our best to be prepared and sharp up top here. Have our minds in tune, have our bodies healthy, because great deceptions are coming. I believe, personally, that it's already begun. I mean, his, his final end game plan, he's already putting the works in place. And I believe a lot of people are missing it. They're not even in tune. So we should do our best to be in tune. What urgent advice does Jesus give us in reference to his second coming? In Matthew 24, 44, he says, Therefore, you also be ready. That's urgent advice. Just be ready. No questions about that. Just be ready because you don't know when he's coming. In Mark 13, 37, he says, What I say to you, I say to all. Okay, that includes you then. And he's saying to his disciples, he's saying to everybody, including us, watch, be on the lookout, be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Now, um, John referenced this in his early, earlier presentation. 2 Peter 3, 4 says, and people will be saying this, where is the promise of his coming? They're doubting it. They're scoffers. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. The world's just going to go on this way. They continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They doubt that Jesus will ever come back. There will be scoffers. But Jesus said, be ready and watch. We just read those verses. How can a person be certain they will be ready to meet Jesus when he returns? Acts 16.31 says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the first step. Just believe. It can't be that simple, can it? It is. Believe. That's step one, number one. Just give yourself to, to Jesus. Believe. And then obey. Follow. If you're believing in him, you're going to live for him. Okay. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If you believe Jesus is your Savior, that he died for you, and you accept that gift of salvation, it really is that simple. God says, you're in. Now, we also don't want to just cast aside what we've, all, what we've been looking at all along here. There will be some who are believers, but they get deceived. There can be deception. Okay? The elect will not be deceived because they are in tune and listening to the word of God. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we've talked about this before. You can only open that door of your heart from the inside. Jesus will not burst in and force himself upon you. He is a gentleman. He is the Prince of Peace. And he says, I'm coming to offer you peace. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Will you let me in today? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that's your choice. You've got to hear his voice. That means if you have too much noise in your life, sometimes young people tell me, I don't feel like God ever speaks to me. I mean, I pray, but I don't think he ever answers. He's not speaking to me. And I ask them, How well are you listening? Is your life full of noise? TV, screen in your hand all the time or in your room, you're on the phone, you're listening to music with your earbuds. There's never a quiet time when God can speak to you. So you have to hear his voice and it's a still small voice, the scripture says. If anyone hears my voice and then opens the door, I will come into him, or her, ladies, you're not excluded, and dine with him and he with me. Remember I told you about how in Middle Eastern culture, dining together means I accept you. You're good with me. We're connecting and fellowshipping. And I told you I couldn't remember the name, the Arab word. It came to me today, actually, when I was preparing for this lesson. 
Mekluba. It means upside down. Remember I told you my, my host Ali with the camels on Mount Carmel, on uh, Mount of Olives, he uh, invited me to his home. His wife made the Mekluba in the big pot. They put a platter over top of it. They flipped the whole thing upside down, removed the pot, and then you all sit down on the floor around a low table and you enjoy your meal together. When you're all picking out of the same pot of food with your hands, that's fellowship. That means I really, I really am okay with you. You're in my house eating food together with me. Jesus says, that's what I want with you. I want to come in and dine with you. I want that closeness. So that's how you can be ready for his return, by believing in him and inviting him into your heart and living with him. Three points to remember. Jesus will surely come again. He promised. MacArthur made a promise and kept it. He's just a man. Jesus is the God-man. I will come again. He meant it. You can trust the promise of Jesus. It's coming to get us. Number two, it will be literal, visible, audible, and glorious. You can't miss it. No one's going to miss it. And we don't need TV or internet to see it. Three, you can be ready, eager for the blessed hope. You don't have to fear. You can be ready. And you can be ready today. Right now, tonight, you can put your head on the pillow tonight with peace and know that you are ready to meet Jesus because you've invited him in and you believe he's your savior. There's no greater peace than that. There's no greater assurance and certainty that when you really trust God's word, it's all right. Come what may. Come hell or high water, as they say, and Satan will try to bring it all to you. Nonetheless, you have that peace that passes understanding because Jesus is living in your heart. There was a story of a little girl who uh, her daddy had to go in for bypass surgery. And when he came out of surgery, uh, the doctor came to the room and daddy was still sleeping. And the little girl was waiting for daddy to wake up. And she asked the doctor, Doc, what did you see when you opened up and looked at my daddy's heart? And he said, well, I, I didn't see. I saw the inside of his heart. I saw blood vessels. I saw ventricle chambers of his heart. That's all. That's all. That's what's in there. He said, and, and she said, you should have seen Jesus in there, doctor, because Jesus lives in my daddy's heart. <laughs> Well, the doctor won't be able to see it, and it won't show up on an MRI or an x-ray, but when God's Spirit is living in you, it will show on the outside, and you will know it because you'll have peace on the inside, too. One day soon, we'll see Jesus coming with all the heavenly angels. It will be a glorious event, and you can eagerly anticipate it with certain hope. All right? The next lesson is rebuilding the temple. Uh, actually, before we do that, let me, let's just pray. Let's close with prayer, and then I'll introduce the next lesson. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the, the promise, the blessed hope of your glorious return. We, we need it. It's the only hope this world has. We see it just tanking, and you see it from heaven. And sometimes we say, Lord, how long? We would love for you to just step in tonight, come and end this mess. But, Lord, there are people that still need to hear the gospel. There are people that you want to save, and uh, the time is not yet. Only you know that hour, Father. Um, but we trust that we can be ready and prepared as we trust Jesus. So tonight, um, I just pray that all of us would once again just make a commitment, or maybe for the first time, say, I believe in you, Jesus. I trust you as my Savior. I invite you into my heart to live with me, and may I have the peace that you promise as the Prince of Peace, and may I be able to face the future with hope and not fear, but certainty in knowing that when you come, I'll be going home with you. I pray that for all of us, Lord, that each one of us can say, that's my experience because I'm opening up my heart to Jesus every day. We thank you for that invitation you've given us and for the glorious hope that can be ours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so next time we're going to look at 
um, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the temple. You know, some people say that before Jesus comes, the temple has to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. When I was there the first time, back in 1992, studying in Jerusalem, people were already talking about building the temple with lasers, because lasers can't be just, you know, you can't knock it down. You just shine the lasers, up, and that'll be like the temple structure outlined with lasers. Uh, you know, what, is that necessary? Is God needing the temple in Jerusalem to be rebuilt? before Jesus comes. Many Christians be believe so. So what was the purpose of God's temple? What did its symbols and ceremonies mean? And do they have any significance for us today? Those are the questions we're going to look at and more next time we're together. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. And uh, I'm, I'm just jazzed about what we're learning. I love what the Bible says. Now we're going to start getting into more and more uh, deeper prophecies beginning tomorrow night. So um, I'm going to invite you to come tomorrow night, sit in your chair, and strap on your seatbelt because we're going to move. All right? We're going to start, start going uh, fast and hard with some uh, deeper Bible prophecy study. All right? God bless you.